We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a, we're going to cover a lot of topics this afternoon. Preventative maintenance. This is the thing, one of the things that when I get a chance to talk to, to men, uh, when doing talks or at wellness fairs or whatever, I encourage men to think about preventative maintenance. I'm told that we as a group don't do as good a job as the ladies do at preventative maintenance on our bodies. Now some men do, but as a group. So what I try to encourage is to, we take care of our car, us we guys, we take care of our lawnmower and our snowblower and we be sure it's got a new spark plug and new oil and we do all the things to be sure it's going to function properly. But sometimes we fail to take care of ourselves the way that we should. And we only have one body to live with. So it's important that we consider preventative maintenance. So let's keep ourselves healthy through prevention and then we won't have to fix things so often or things won't get out of hand um, in, in a way relative to our health. A lot of the women that I talk to say, my hus I can't get my husband to the doctor, I can't. So guys, this is an opportunity to, to show the girls that we can do it. Um, Men through the decades, in our 20s, I'm not sure if there's anybody in here in our 20s right now at the moment, they say that real men wear seat belts. I know that if you have a car similar to the one that I have, I, I want to wear my seat belt and I do, but even if I didn't want to, it wouldn't let me because it would go beep, 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 and it would drive me crazy until I put my seat belt on. But in the 20s, real men wear seat belts. In our 30s, we would think about no man should be an island. Establish a balance between work, family, and friends that can sustain you through the rest of your years. When we're in our 40s, obesity happens. The C word is, is calories, not carbs. Exercise or walk at least 30 minutes a day. Exercise being one of the things as we talk about various topics this afternoon is one of the most important things and the best things that we can do for our body. As you probably all know, it takes the deficit of 3,500 calories to lose one pound. In our, four, okay, in our 50s, real men have doctors. See your doctor for screenings, have your blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, weight, PSA, and blood sugar monitored. This is one of the, this is the first thing we always want to encourage men to do. Women as well. Retain a family doctor and use them when you need them. Once you have a family doctor, you can establish that relationship between yourself and your doctor. He understands your physical needs better than anyone else and you can take care of your health needs. But first of all, we need to have someone to go to that has all of our health information. So retain that family doctor and utilize them for the appropriate screenings as we go through life as needed. Um, in our 60s, expand your horizons. Travel, enjoy sports, take a course, enjoy your hobbies like bicycling. Whatever it might be, whatever your hobbies are, um, enjoy those things in your 60s. In your 70s, use it or lose it. Um, participate in men mentally stimulating activities to decrease our chances of something like Mr. Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. Use our minds. Find something that's stim stimulating and that kind of keeps our mind active and stimulated. Men by the numbers. On the average, the male, uh, average male is 5 foot 9 inches, 172 pounds on the average. Weight distribution, 43% of that weight is muscle. 14% fat, 12% internal organs, 9% connective tissue and skin, and 8% of that is blood. Interestingly enough, and I know we've all heard this at some point back in biology class or wherever, but two-thirds of our body is comprised of water. Our heartbeats, I tried to re relate that to the national deficit, and it's the only reason I can figure out what that number is. I think it's 2 billion, 700 million, heartbeats over a lifetime at the average heartbeat of 72 to 80 per minute is what the, what the average man would have. I know the, the national deficit is much higher than that. But um, The number of bones in our body, 206 bones. 
Average number of sperm produced, a male sperm, 3,000 per second. Two, or, two to three hundred, uh, hundred million are moved in a single ejaculation. Average hair count, for many of us, this would be when we were younger. For some, it are doing better than others. 100,000 hairs. Um, and the la average life expectancy in the United States for the male is 75.6 years of age. Male tendencies. Males tend to live a little bit less healthy lifestyle than women, and some do not seek medical attention when they need to. It's the kind of the whole macho thing, like, I think I'm sick, I know I'm sick, but I'll get through it, I'm tough. Well, we need to try to overcome that and get the medical attention when it's needed. Men tend to engage in more risky behaviors than the ladies do. Men tend to define themselves by their work, which then increases our stress level. Um, estimates for life expectancy rank male life expectancy in the United States is only 28th um, compared to the rest of the world um, as far as life expectancy is concerned. So there are countries around the world that are doing something better, whether it's the exercise, whether it's the nutrition, whether it's a combination. On the average, a white man lives five years longer than an African-American man. These are just... Now, lead, leading causes of male death. Um, we have number one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. And number three is injuries. And then on and on from there. But those are the top three causes of male death. Heart disease, cancer, and injuries. Talk we, Back to the previous slide, men tend to live... a little bit, have a little bit more risky behavior the way we live our lives. 75.6 years, the average for men, which we mentioned already, for females is 80.6. Okay, the first was heart disease that we just mentioned from the previous slide. Heart disease affects 9.4% of white men, affects 7.1% of African American men, and 5.6% of Mexican-American men. There was a study done out in Massachusetts and it continues on. It was called the Framington Study. It showed that men have a 49% lifetime risk of developing coronary artery, um, coronary heart disease after the age of 40. The average age of the first heart attack, 66 years of age. We see men, I, as uh, Lynn mentioned, I worked in the operating room for years. We're seeing a lot of men coming in for open heart surgery, upper 30s, 40s, 50s, pretty commonplace. But still the average is 66 years of age based on this study. Major risk factors for heart disease, hypertension, which is one and the same as high blood pressure, um, high cholesterol, tobacco use, which we all know is a no-no. Um, diabetes, physical inactivity, and poor nutrition. Colorectal cancer. Um, by definition, colorectal cancer <clears throat> is the cancer of the colon, the rectum, the appendix, or the anus. Um, in 2010, it's expected that there will be 106,000 new cases of colon cancer and 40,000 new cases of rectal cancer. It affects both men and women, it doesn't discriminate, usually 50 years and older, all races and all ethnic groups. It's the second most um, common cause of cancer in men after lung cancer and prostate cancer. Um, second leading cancer killer in the United States after lung. A screening colonoscopy, typically um, what's suggested is that we have a screening colonoscopy at age 50 if there's a family history, it should be sooner, probably age 40 to age 45. This is where it's beneficial to have that family doctor that the two of you can sit down and determine what's, when is the best time um, for you to have that screening colonoscopy. But in general, it's age 50. Um, what a screening colonoscopy does, it detects polyps. Polyps are abnormal growths in the colon or the rectum and they, they can be safely removed before they become cancerous if they're detected early enough. When they're caught early, the survival rate is 90%. So again, the insurance companies several years back decided it was time to pay for screening colonoscopies to prevent pr 
problems before the problems happen and then pay for the expense of what happens after a person has cancer. Prostate cancer, to just talk first of all about the prostate gland itself. This is our, as a guy, this is our best friend and can be our worst enemy. Um, the prostate gland is a walnut sized organ that's found at the base of the bladder. What the prostate does, it's, it stores and secretes a clear fluid that along with uh, sperm constitutes what we refer to as semen. The prostate contains smooth muscle which helps to expel the semen during the process of ejaculation. Um, prostate cancer, the second leading cause of cancer in men. There is something called benign prostatic hypertrophy or hyperplasia, sometimes you hear it referred as, or usually BPH. Um, and what this is, is an enlargement of the prostate gland. It's not cancer, but it is an overgrowth of the prostate gland in men that usually the prostate gland will start in just in a normal normal man will start to grow grow or enlarge after approximately age 40 it's just part of the normal um, aging process this doesn't happen in all men but it's very common that it does happen over age 40 and we'll talk more about that as we go how do we screen for prostate cancer one of the things that the, our doctor will do as a matter of our, as, uh, a part of our yearly screening or physical is a DRE or a digital rectal exam, which is one of those deals where for the guys in the room, you hate to turn your back on the doctor when you know he's coming at you with a big glove on his hand, but a digital rectal exam and the physician can feel if the prostate gland is approximately normal size and if, if it's normal consistency, or he can feel nodules, he or she, I should say, can feel nodules, or if there's anything that feels abnormal, just do that digital rectal exam. The second thing is the PSA. Um, the PSA uh, test, which is a blood test, should begin um, for men at age 50, unless there's a family history, or unless um, the person is African American, and then it will start around age 40 to 45, again, to be determined um, between the patient and physician. And we're gonna be talking more about that as we go too. PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. And what PSA is, it's a chemical that's actually made by the prostate gland. So the digital rectal exam and the PSA, those are the two screening tests for, for prostate. Metabolic syndrome, this is a biggie that we're hearing a lot more about in the medical community. What it is, is a cluster of conditions that occur together, increasing your risk of heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and dementia. It's also known as insulin resistant syndrome, um, or it's kind of a, considered a pre-diabetic condition, metabolic syndrome. An estimated 47 million people in the United States have metabolic syndrome. Causes overweight or obesity, physical inactivity, um, and genetic factors. Um, lifestyle changes, if we know we have metabolic syndrome, and we can only know that through screening, and I'll show you that, how that works in a minute. Lifestyle changes can delay or derail metabolic syndrome completely if we just know that we have the problem um, through various things like uh, diet changes and exercise. Metabolic syndrome is the presence of three or more of the following components that I'm going to talk about here briefly. Central obesity of the five, this one we would know if we're, if we're overweight we can tell. We can look in the mirror, we can stand on a scale. With men, um, the abdominal around the abdomen should be 40 inches or less. In a woman, 35 inches or less. Um, and this is the fat tissue around the abdomen. Sometimes it's, it's a very unhealthy accumulation of fat around the abdomen and it does, does things to the body that's very unhealthy. In fact, sometimes it's referred to as toxic belly fat. Um, so. Again, we can measure that and we can know if we're overweight or not. 
Fasting blood triglycerides, which is your blood fat. Uh, the number isn't really important that we know that, but if your triglycerides or your blood fat is high, it fosters plaque buildup in the blood vessels. We wouldn't know if our triglycerides are high unless we're getting tested from time to time. HDL cholesterol, that's the healthy cholesterol. I always remember H for healthy cholesterol. Um, the numbers there aren't real important, but it needs to be at certain levels in order for it to be where it needs to be for us to be as healthy as possible. And the only way we can know where those numbers are is, is if we get tested from time to time. If the HDL cholesterol is not where it needs to be, it again can foster plaque buildup um, in the vessels. Blood pressure, um, unless we're checking it, we won't know, but um, from, from the perspective of metabolic syndrome, they're looking at a number of 130 over 85. And I'm going to talk more about blood pressure here in a minute and give you some more numbers there. Fasting glucose, or your blood sugar, um, greater than or equal to 100. Um, they, it should be 100 or less to be in a normal range, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute too. Um, insulin resistance is when the body can't use insulin efficiently. Okay, just to talk a little bit about cholesterol, because this is really some interesting stuff. And this applies obviously not just to men. There will be some things we're going to talk about that are male specific, but a lot of this is related to both male and female. What is cholesterol? It's a soft, waxy substance that's found in the bloodstream, and it's found in all of our body's cells. It's used to form cell membranes and some hormones in the body. It cannot dissolve in the blood, and that's kind of the key. And I'm going to talk more about that in the next slide. It has to be transported to and from the cells by LDL, which is the bad cholesterol or the lousy cholesterol, or the, the healthy cholesterol, the HDL. So cholesterol by itself would just lay in our vessels and do nothing but bad for us. But it's the, it's the HDL and the LDL that have to transport it to the proper location. Low density lipoprotein, which is the LDL, which is the bad cholesterol. It's the major cholesterol carrier in the blood. If you have too much LDL in your blood or bad cholesterol, plaque can slowly build up in the arterial walls. It's also known, and the, that buildup is also known as atherosclerosis. We've probably heard that term. Sometimes we refer to LDL as the bad or the lousy cholesterol, which I've already mentioned. Lower levels of LDL, um, with lower levels of LDL, will have less risk of heart disease and stroke blood and blood clots. LDL, the, that's the number that's optimum, and the numbers, like I say in our conversation today, don't make that much difference. High density lipoprotein, now this is the healthy cholesterol. About one third of the blood cholesterol is carried to the tissue by the healthy cholesterol, HDL. It carries cholesterol away from the arteries, which again is very key. Um, it carries um, excess cholesterol to the liver and, and then outside of the body, so it gets rid of the excesses. Experts believe that the HDL actually will remove cholesterol from plaque that may already have been formed in our, in our vessels, and it slows, it slows plaque growth. Um, again, there's a number for you, but again, we don't want to get um, to carry it away with the numbers. How do we improve cholesterol? Decrease foods from animals. Uh, American Heart Association suggests 200 to 300 milligrams of cholesterol intake per day. And the thing to think to remember about cholesterol is the body produces all the cholesterol that the body needs. We don't need any cholesterol from outside sources but whether we want it or not, it comes to us with the food we eat. Just because it's, it's in the, no matter how healthy we try to eat, we're going to get some cholesterol. But the AHA suggests no more than two or two to three hundred milligrams from our dietary source. Um, use more vegetable products for protein. Example, beans, fruits, grains, nuts, or seeds. Eat a lot of fruits and veggies. They say five to nine servings per day. Um, lean meats, low-fat dairy products, exercise increases HDL. With LDL, the only way 
that it's known to get a handle on the bad cholesterol is by improving our dietary cholesterol by watching what we eat. But it's known that we can raise the, the good cholesterol through exercise. Um, smoking lowers the HDL cholesterol, which obviously is not good. And if you consume alcohol, it's suggested that we do so in moderation. Okay, now we want to talk about hypertension or high blood pressure. These are all things that were kind of associated with the metabolic syndrome, if you recall. Um, the definition of blood pressure to start with is the top number. Like if you see your blood pressure was 120 over 80. The 120, that's the systolic pressure. It's the pressure in the vessels when the heart is actually pumping blood. That's the systolic number, or the top number. The lower number, or the diastolic number, that's a measurement of the pressure in the vessels between heartbeats, or when the heart is relaxed. So it's systolic, diastolic, one is when the, when the heart's pumping, and one is when the heart's relaxed. Um, the, it's determined by the volume pumped and the resistance to flow in your arteries. So the amount of blood volume we have and the amount of resistance in our blood vessels is what's going to determine what our blood pressure is. And the more um, plaque buildup we have in our vessels, the higher the resistance and perhaps the higher the, the blood pressure number might be. Um, both of these systolic and diastolic pressures are measured in millimeters of mercury. Um, a normal, uh, in general, for most people, um, a, gen a, a normal blood pressure would be 120 for the top number, systolic, and 80 for, for the lower number. Um, Pre-hypertension, you can see 120 to 139 and 80 to 89. Hypertension stage 1, 140 to 159 uh, and 90 to 99. Hypertension stage 2, anything above 160 and anything above 100 is considered hypertension. So how do we normalize our blood pressure if we have a problem with blood pressure? And how do we know we have high blood pressure? It's by going to the doctor and getting it tested or going to a blood pressure machine. But keeping an eye on it is the, is the key. Regular exercise. I recently listened to five different physicians speak in the same night with five different specialties. And the bottom line, the common denominator with each and every one of them was the importance of exercise in our lives. The no, uh, to have a normal weight in what we refer to in, in the medical community is body mass index when we're looking at weight. Um, it's not important that we get into that a lot, but a BMI of 25 or less is where we want to be. And I can talk to you more about that later if you're interested in knowing more about that. Reduce dietary sodium. I can't even find the salt shaker at home. And I don't want to find it anymore because I've gotten used to not having it. My wife's got it hidden someplace. so. Um, but I've gotten used to not using any excess salt. Um, no smoking, obviously. Limit alcohol from none to two drinks per day maximum. Reduce stress in our lives. And that's easy to say, harder to do, I realize. You want to have a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, again. Low and low fat dairy products, reduce saturated and total fat. And then in some cases where we do need help to get our blood pressure lowered, medication as needed. And there's different types of medications that do different things. Some lower the blood volume. Those are like diuretics. And then there's others that have an effect on how big the pipe is. It, it, can, it can expand or contract the, the vessel and help to help our blood pressure. Diabetes. Um, three main types of diabetes. There's type 1 that was formerly known as juvenile diabetes. Type 2 which was formerly considered adult onset diabetes. And then there's gestational diabetes. And this is one that happens during the late stages of pregnancy in some females. Now, prediabetes is a condition where the glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough to have a diagnosis of diabetes. And I'm going to give you some numbers on that in a minute. Um, in this case, when you're in the pre-diabetic mode, you have an increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes, um, heart disease, and stroke, of course. Um, with the knowledge of prediabetes, you can avoid type 2 diabetes or, or taking that step from the prediabetes into full-blown diabetes with weight loss and physical activity. 
and that can happen. But again, we have to know what our blood glucose is in order to know that there's something we need to do to head it off at the pass, and that comes through regular um, screenings and examinations with your physician. Type 1 diabetes, usually um, first diagnosed in children um, or young adults. In this case, in, in um, type 1 diabetes, the beta cells of the pancreas no longer making insulin. The body's immune system has attacked and destroyed. Um, treatment with type 1, insulin, wise food choices, physical activity, controlling our blood pressure, and also monitoring our cholesterol with type 1. Now with type 2, which is the most common form of diabetes, um, it can develop at any age, that's important to know. Begins with insulin resistance, where fat, muscle, and liver cells do not use the insulin properly. The pancreas tries to keep up with the production, but then eventually loses its ability to keep up. Um, treatment for type 2 diabetes, diabetic medications, wise food choices, physical activity, controlling blood pressure, and cholesterol. Now gestational diabetes, um, women may develop this during the late stages of pregnancy, which we mentioned earlier, usually goes away after the baby is born. Um, with, when, for females that have gestational diabetes, that, this particular female is more likely to develop type 2 diabetes later in life. Does, doesn't mean they will just mean that there would be a greater tendency for that. Um, and the gestational diabetes is caused by hormones of pregnancy um, or a shortage of insulin. So those are the three different types of diabetes. So what are the signs and symptoms of diabetes? Being very thirsty, urinating often, feeling very hungry or tired, losing weight without trying, sores that heal slowly, usually on the lower extremities, dry, itchy skin, losing feeling or having tingling in your feet, and blurry eyesight are all signs and symptoms of diabetes. The blood sugar numbers for a fasting blood sugar, 70 to 100 is in the normal range. 100 to 125 is what's considered pre-diabetes. This is where you want to get a handle on it and do some lifestyle changes and avoid going over the edge. And then 126 or higher is when it's considered uh, either type 1 or type 2 full-blown diabetes. Now we're going to get into a male specific situation here. This is called andropause, sometimes referred to as male menopause. Um, a definition of andropause is a set of physical and psychological changes that men generally go through in middle age. Not all men do, but some men do. It's caused by lower levels of testosterone. Interestingly, after age 30, our testosterone level in a man starts to diminish slowly after age 30 and drops by 10% every decade from that point on. Um, symptoms of andropause or male menopause or some people like to call it midlife crisis. Um, you can be physical and can be psychological symptoms both associated with let you can symptoms lethargy, decreased energy, decreased libido and interest in sex, erectile dysfunction, inability to sleep, hot flashes, all those things that are listed there. Treatment for andropause or male menopause is a testosterone replacement. Sometimes it could be with some men, there could be some other um, types of counseling associated with it as well. But the first thing that will happen is a blood draw will happen and see what the testosterone level is. But this is a real deal. Us, we guys, a lot of us thought that just ladies had menopause, but some men actually go through menopause as well. Male breast cancer. It's most common in men between the ages of 60 and 70. Um, females are 100 times more likely to develop breast cancer than a male is. Um, symptoms, breast skin dimpling or puckering. Retraction of the nipple, scaling or redness of the breast skin, nipple discharge. Those are symptoms of male breast cancer. Causes, sometimes it's hereditary. There's been a, there's a family history. Smoking, poor diet, liver disease, excess alcohol, obesity, or estrogen drugs can have an impact on, on um, male breast cancer. The treatment would be the same as the, uh, would be for a, a female with breast cancer. Um, biopsy, surgery chemo, and radiation would be treatment for male breast cancer. Now, erectile dysfunction is 
a real big problem with men across the board. And there's a lot of reasons for it. And it's one of those things that men don't like to talk about. Even when they're in talking to their family doctor and the doctor says, is there any, there's a commercial like this on TV I've noticed lately about asking questions when you're with your physician. And the doctor asks, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? And a man is so embarrassed to talk about if there's an erectile dysfunction problem. Erectile dysfunction is the inability of a man to maintain a firm erection long enough for sex, at least 25% of the time. It can be caused um, by physical problems and usually is more physical than psychological, although there can be psychological reasons as well. Um, heart disease, clogged vessels, high blood pressure, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, certain medications, heart medications can cause erectile dysfunction, for example. Some can in some patients. Um, certain surgeries of the pelvic area, one of them being prostatectomy. There's a certain percentage of men who, who struggle with erectile dysfunction after having a prostatectomy. Um, Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis are all possible causes. One thing to, to think about is that all the literature sh says if you're erection healthy, you're probably heart healthy. If you're heart healthy, you're probably erection healthy. And the reason for that is the two little vessels that allows the blood to go to the appropriate place to cause the erection, if those two tiny vessels are not functioning correctly, there's probably a reason for it. And that reason could be that there's plaque building up in those two little vessels. And because they're so tiny, they, they may show symptoms in erectile dysfunction, and that then should be a key to say, if I'm developing plaque there, I wonder if I'm developing plaque in my coronary arteries. So there's been a real correlation between men if they start to have erectile dysfunction problems and considering are we having arterial um, plaque build up in other areas of our body. Um, for uh, psychological causes, anxiety, stress, depression, fatigue, and poor communication with our sexual partner. Um, treatments, obviously we've heard all about the Viagra and the Levitra and the Cialis. It's on every sports commercial just about. Um, but medications um, have helped a lot of men. Penile implants, penis pumps, counseling. There are even other things that help. But the thing about erectile dysfunction is that there is help out there if, if guys would just be willing to sit down with their doctor and talk about it.